Hello, everyone. Can uh, can you hear me? Hopefully, everyone can hear. A few housekeeping things before we start. Everyone is automatically muted, so you don't need to be, worry about muting your line. You can hear the audio in two different ways. You can hear through the microphone and speakers on your phone, or you can access the audio portion of the webinar by calling in through your phone with the number provided on the audio panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, just FYI, we will have a Q&A session right after the webinar. There's a question box uh, over to the right where you can log questions throughout the webinar. And FYI, this webinar is being recorded and it will be sent to you tomorrow. So my name is Dennis Hyde and I'll be the moderator for our webinar today. So onto the webinar, water reuse, the future source for raw water makeup for the power industry. I'd like to introduce our esteemed speaker now, Bridget Finnegan. Bridget is a process engineer at Veolia Water Technologies Industrial Projects Group in Pittsburgh. She earned her bachelor's in chemical engineering at Penn State. Bridget specializes in biological and disc filter design and has been involved in some of Veolia's highest visibility projects. Bridget? Thank you, Dennis. Uh, today I'm gonna discuss the background of using reclaimed water for makeup water for power plants, and then talk about why it's a win-win situation and uh, the source of reclaimed water, the what and the why, some of the challenges that uh, facilities would face if they're thinking about using reclaimed water, the treat uh, treatment processes to um, solve those challenges, uh, some case studies where we implemented reclaimed water for thermoelectric power plants, and um, some final statements. So reclaimed water, why, why um, is this even looked at for the power industry? Well, the thermoelectric power industry is the largest single source user of fresh water in the United States. According to the USGS 2015 report, uh, the thermal electric power industry used 133 billion gallons of water per day. Um, they were, uh, it was 41% of total withdrawals, and it was 38% of um, fresh water surface, fresh surface water withdrawals. Um, so as a result of all this water demand, the power plant location is normally driven by the fresh water source where it's located and it has to be nearby. Uh, the fresh water sources are becoming limited, especially in the western United States and intake water permits are becoming uh, very difficult to obtain. It's very costly and a very long process um, due to environmental considerations and also like not in my backyard um, uh, demonstrations and so forth. So why is reclaimed water a win-win situation? So um, because reclaimed water is the, is the treated effluent of, the, of a municipal wastewater um, treatment system, in, in this presentation, I'm going to abbreviate that POTW, which stands for Publicly Owned Treatment Works. Um, and so the POTW would discharge this water typically to a, to a water body, usually a, a surface water source. And the, a power plant would also typically draw from a, a surface water, um, surface fresh water source as well. So instead of one discharging into the water body and the other one taking it out, it kind of um, cuts that off. You can see in the picture there that it goes directly from the uh, POTW to the thermoelectric power plant. Uh, so the win-win is the power plant doesn't discharge as much water as they would have otherwise. Uh, so it could save the POTW money uh, because there's less, less load to the surface water source. And also uh, it gives the power plant a, a reliable source of fresh water. So as I mentioned, the, the source of reclaimed water is, is the secondary or tertiary treated effluent from the POTW. Um, and, and at times, as I mentioned here, that it is, uh, if there is a combined sewer system for that uh, municipality, that it could also mean the combined um, just primary treatment. So, so the, the stormwater and the wastewater would combine into the wastewater treatment system, but it would bypass the secondary treatment at times, and, and the reclaimed water would then just be primary treated wastewater. Uh, reclaimed water goes by a couple different names. Uh, reclaimed water is sort of the more technical name that we use for it. It can also be called gray water 
or Title 22 water, which is referencing uh, California water standard for reuse, or purple pipe water, uh, which references the color that a lot of uh, power plants use if they if they use reclaimed water, they paint the pipes purple for, for safety and, and um, to alert the people that that's carrying reclaimed water. So why would we use uh, reclaimed water for a power plant? Uh, sometimes it's only it's the only source available in, in desert locations. It's also a cost-effective solution. Um, that it, it was found in a study in 2013 that if a power plant was located within uh, 25 miles of a POTW, um, presuming that the POTW had it, was treating enough water to to serve the demand of the power plant, that it was a cost-effective solution. Um, it reduces the permitting time, which is important for a lot of these facilities that are, that are building, and also it is environmentally friendly. However, there are some challenges, as you, as you might expect, uh, to the reclaimed water, uh, to using reclaimed water as makeup water. Um, the first one is BOD, biological oxygen demand. It is um, the, I guess the extent of the problem is dependent on the performance of the POTW. Because the um, all, all POTWs have a um, have a biological treatment system that removes BOD, but if for some reason if the the um, POTW is not performing very well, or uh, they do have this combined sewer and so it doesn't go into the secondary treatment, um, then then the makeup water source then has a has a high BOD content, which could lead to bio growth. Um, phosphorus is, is a problem sometimes uh, due to the scaling potential if there's calcium present. That often has to be removed. Uh, ammonia, if, if the POTW doesn't have a uh, tertiary treatment system or nitrification, they, they, um, they're discharging sort of a high load of ammonia, which can cause a lot of problems in the cooling tower uh, with corrosion and stress cracking of the copper and copper bearing alloys, fouling of heat exchangers, and the increased chlorine demand through the breakpoint chlorination reaction. Some additional challenges uh, with reclaimed water is high TSS, especially as I mentioned in these uh, bypassing events, that um, that the TSS can get quite high. Uh, the chlorine, if you if the reclaimed water is isn't given before the chlorination step, then you have free chlorine in the water, which could be corrosive uh, to brass equipment, the adhesive desincification, uh, and the degradation of copper corrosion inhibitors. And also, there's sometimes nitrate present in the wastewater, uh, which could lead to biogrowth. So a typical treatment process for reclaimed water, precipitation and clarification. Uh, this would remove the phosphorus if, if it's necessary uh, using ferric dosing, pretty common, common reaction in other industries especially. Um, and it also serves for TSS removal. It also can remove some of the metals. Iron and manganese are often a targeted uh, item to keep very low in a cooling tower, so this, this step of the treatment process would be uh, would remove those as well. Uh, lime soda softening, this is if you have calcium and magnesium hardness uh, that you need to get rid of or silica removal. And then biological treatment, this is necessary in, in every case if, if there's no um, ammonia treatment upstream. And sometimes if you would like uh, nitrate removed as well. There's two, there's two um, biological treatment processes among the, the many that Veolia has in their portfolio, an MBBR, which is a moving bed bioreactor, and a biosteer, which is a biologically activated filter. Um, we'll talk more about those two systems later. So here's just sort of a, a, a treatment process that Veolia has installed on reclaimed water as makeup for a power plant. Uh, you can see there's an MBBR there. Uh, and what an MBBR is, I can explain it now, is um, that they're plastic, there's pieces of plastic media. You can see them a little bit in the picture in there. They look a little bit like wagon wheels. And oh, this, this picture. Um, and uh, on, on those little wagon wheels, the bacteria grow and they form what is called a biofilm. Uh, and that biofilm is, is uh, contained or is consisting of this bacteria that either nitrifies or um, uh, or, or removes BOD or, or whatever you're looking for it to do. Whatever you feed it, they'll, the bacteria will grow um, to remove it. And then downstream of uh, the MBBR is the DAF, dissolved air flotation unit, which removes the solids. Uh, and as you can see, the effluent of this relatively simple
simple raw water treatment system. It goes through a, a US, this ultra filtration step, and then first pass, second pass RO, and then to a CDEI, um, electro deionization, um, where then it becomes demineralized water and is used as makeup water to a boiler. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of incredible that uh, we have you know municipal wastewater come into a POTW and eventually it gets treated and treated and treated until um, you can use it even as ultra pure water makeup to a uh, boiler. So here's uh, one of the first case studies um, in the city of Mankato. There's a water reclamation facility um, and it and it treats water to up to the California Title 22 standards, and they supply the cooling tower needs for uh, a power plant nearby. Um, and uh, they saved, you can see the some surface water use that the power plant would have would have taken from the surface water, and $1.5 million in potable water costs every year. Uh, this next case study is the West Stemford Energy Station. Um, it's a 738 megawatt natural gas fired and combined cycle electric generating facility. Um, it, it, the treatment plant um, that feeds the West Deptford Energy Station is, it's called the Gloucester County Utilities Authority and it um, and, and it's performing relatively well. So it has, uh, the, the system is a little bit more simple. It has a biosteer and then a disc filter for um, TSS polishing. Here is the um, process flow diagram for that system. You can see it comes in, gets oxidized, um, and then uh, some pH adjustments and reduction, and it goes into that bath, this biosteer, biologically activated filter. It's an upflow uh, reactor where instead of, uh, similar to the MBBR, where the biofilm grew on that plastic media, the same concept is applied here, that the, the biofilm that grows on the, a plastic media that's packed inside um, a, a cell, it's called. And, uh, but it, because the, the, the plastic media is not moving, it's in fact packed, it also removes TSS. So as you can imagine, there's a TSS influent limit, um, and that's what, uh, why it's important that the G, GCUA uh, doesn't have these upsets very often because um, they, can, they can implement this, this biosteer. Uh, so the, the water goes through the biosteer and the nitrifying bacteria have grown as, as a biofilm on this plastic media. And as the water passes through the media, um, these bacteria um, nitrify the ammonia into nitrate. And uh, when the effluent comes out, it is polished by a disc filter, downstream disc filter, and um, disinfected with hypochlorite. Uh, the hypochlorite is dosed before and after. Uh, the first one is to prevent the biogrowth on, on the disc filter, and the second one is to, is to maintain a chlorine residual in the downstream processes. So here's the water quality for that case study, this West Stemford uh, Energy Station. Um, you can see, as I mentioned, the BOD is, is coming in at 13 and needs to be down less than 10. So that's a pretty easy jump. Um, and the TSS is also coming in less than 21. So again, that's a um, relatively easy removal percentage, at least. Uh, the iron and manganese does need to be removed. And the, and the big need for removal is the ammonia. And that's why the importance of the biosteer. Um, the rest of the... Um, the parameters are, are um, suitable for the treatment. So here's a, a third case study um, in Northeastern US Power Station. It's uh, going to be started up in 2020. It's already, the raw water treatment system has already been installed. Um, it's a, it will be a thousand megawatt natural gas fired facility. Um, and it requires 5,200 GPM of raw water. So that's about 7.5 uh, MGD. The last the West Deptford requires a 7.3 MGD for comparison. So they're roughly the same demand. Um, and they're using reclaimed water from uh, a nearby POTW. Uh, the, the, the reclaimed water is being used for, for every single water demand in the, in the facility except for um, potable water. Um, so the, the um, water from the POTW, the reclaimed water goes in first to a uh, COD, BOD removal uh, MBBR, where the BOD, COD is removed, as you might guess, uh, and then a nitrification MBBR. We split up those two stages um, because nitrifying bacteria are less efficient in the presence of BOD. 
So if you separate out the two types of bacteria, then, then the nitrifiers perform better. So, uh, and that's easier to do in an, in an MBBR uh, versus like an activated sled system, uh, that those two stages can be separated out a bit more easily. Um, so the effluent of the MBBR goes into a rapid mix tank where those uh, ferric chloride is dosed for phosphorus removal, pH is adjusted, and then the hypochlorite is dosed just for, um, to, to prevent biogrowth from the downstream uh, clarifier. So from the rapid mix tank, it goes to the Actiflow, which is Veolia's high-rate sand ballasted clarifier. Um, there's, yeah, the only addition within the Actiflow is the polymer addition. Um, and then the, the sludge goes to a waste dump and then is thickened and dewatered. And the effluent goes for a, to a disc filter for TSS polishing. Uh, the effluent of the disc filter flows into a sump uh, where hypochlorite is dosed once again, um, both to maintain the downstream chlorine residual, but also it is a safety uh, because we have the ability to um, dose enough hypochlorite for breakpoint chlorination. So if for some reason there's an upset and the nitrification reactor doesn't perform as, it, as we would like, uh, we can still prevent the ammonia from, from affecting the cooling tower downstream by uh, dosing a higher dose of, of hypochlorite. Here's the water quality from the um, from the case study that we're speaking about. Um, as you can see, the BOD is much higher. This uh, this POTW does have a combined sewer system, and during storm events, it has permission to bypass its secondary treatment. So when it bypasses, it has a um, a much higher TSS, as you can see, that 940, and sort of associated with it the, a higher BOD. Um, the phosphorus is higher, again, associated with the TSS mostly, and then the ammonia can, is, is, I would say, typically high um, because it is, a, it is reclaimed water. So um, the, the process flow diagram that you can see um, in the previous slide, so we, all of those systems are, are to treat that effluent. So it's the COD and BOD, and the uh, ammonia are removed in the biological step, and then the TSS is removed primarily with the act flow and then polished off by the disc filter. And with it, the associated um, criteria as well. So in summary, um, reclaimed water is being turned to more and more as a source of fresh water for the thermal electric power industry, um, even in non-water stressed areas, uh, because it's a reclaimed water, using reclaimed water is a cost-effective and safe um, solution. It, it's a constant source of water, so there's no worry about drought, and it meets a core goal of the power industry to extend the water cycle and preserve a valuable resource. So with that. Super, Bridget. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. Feel free to type in your questions on the right-hand side of the box. Um, if we if there ends up being questions we don't get to, we can follow up with answers after the webinar. So I already have some questions in the queue. Thank you to everyone for bringing up your question. Question one, uh, Bridget, how do you design a treatment plant to handle storm and upset conditions? Uh, so uh, as I mentioned in the, in the final case study, uh, we, we would have to have uh, a treatment process that would be able to handle high TSS. So that's one of the advantages of, of using an MBBR because the, the bed is constantly moving, all these pieces of plastic media are, are constantly moving in the, in the case of nitrification and COD with air. Um, so it doesn't really mind a high load of TSS. So the TSS just sort of passes through the reactor. So that's how we, we handle the high TSS in the biological stage. But then in the downstream um, solid separation step, uh, we would probably again turn to an active flow. Uh, it's a very proven technology. It can handle really high TSS and we get an effluent of less than 10. Uh, we can guarantee an effluent less than 10. So um, that's usually the technology that we turn to in that situation. Um, and yeah, we, it would depend on each site uh, what would be optimal for it, but that would probably be my generic answer. S super. Um, okay, we have another one here. Uh, what about TDS? Any studies on that? Uh, the TDS 
I mean, we do have the water quality in, in a couple of these, um, in, in the case studies. It hasn't been an issue in terms of cycling up in the power plant. Um, it hasn't been actually very different than uh, surface water, but we haven't studied TDS, I guess, specifically, except to say that it, it has been implemented successfully in, in a normal cooling tower situation. Okay, here's another one from uh, um, Aaron here. Does EPA offer any flexibility in NPDES permitting if your outfall is resulting from POTW reclaimed water? Uh, TSS, TDS, other stuff that would be relatively higher. Um, I don't. I don't know that one specifically. How the EPA would treat that outfall? Because I'm just out in the raw water treatment systems, which is the the intake side of it. Okay. Here's another question for Bridget. With power plants taking water from the POTW. Does this increase capacity or make it easier to treat it? Um, the, the POTW is actually, well, from the treatment perspective, is relatively unaffected. We don't necessarily increase their capacity or, or change their treatment system at all, uh, which is uh, helpful for them in, in, in one perspective. Uh, we just take whatever they're producing. So, so the POTW itself, that their treatment doesn't change. Okay. Here's another one. Is the water quality discharge better or worse than at the POTW? So when we um, take in the POTW discharge, it is it is as far as they've treated it. So if the if the POTW is required to do tertiary treatment, uh, we would take their tertiary effluent. But um, a lot of treatment plants in the United States aren't required to do that. So if at least in the in the two case studies that I mentioned here, um, they weren't required to do nitrification in the in the POTW, and we did nitrification in the, in the power plant. So um, the water that is, even after it's cycled up, when it's discharged, is actually cleaner than it would be if the POTW was to discharge it directly. There's, there's less constituents or concentrations of constituents. Okay. Here's one. Any special recommendations if using a boiler feed water system that utilizes reclaimed water? So, um, we, yeah, we have used it in the past. Um, for, for sure, you have to make sure to prevent biofouling. It is a bigger risk when you're using reclaimed water. And also um, that, you, that it would be good to have well, it's always good to have redundancy, but even even more than that, maybe uh, remote control. I know Veolia Vi offers a system called AquaVista, where you can you can have a remote access to uh, HMI or the control of the um, membrane system, and so you can have a, a better control on that with the um, like with the different kind of water. You can have a better control with this uh, AquaVista system. Okay. We have another one come, that came in here. What is the waste stream generated from, and how is this managed? The waste stream generated from the raw water treatment systems is, I'm presuming, what the answer yeah. is about. Um, it's, what is it generated from? It's, yeah, okay, it's generated from uh, the active flow in, in one case, or the disk filter. So what happens is, well, in an active flow, um, the sludge is, is attached to the sand and the sand is recirculated around, put through a hydrocyclone, and the hydrocyclone separates the sand from the sludge. So the sludge goes out the top, the sand gets re-injected back in, re is recycled to be reused in, within the active flow system. Um, and, that, and that sludge would be uh, flowing more or less by gravity from the top of the hydrocyclone. In the disk filter scenario, um, when the solids build up on the filter cloth, uh, the disk filter is, is a, we, we sell the hydrotech disk filter, so it's partially submerged. So whenever the solids build up on the disk filter cloth, the um, the disk rotates and it puts the clean part of the cloth into the water, so it continues to filter. And the um, solids that have built up on the filter is, are rotated out and uh, sprayed off. There's a backwash sprayer, and it's sprayed off into a trough in the middle. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so from the, the trough, um, that backwash sludge 
it is exposed by gravity to typically to a cell. Okay. Okay, um, so we're coming to the end of our time with Bridget here uh, at the end of our webinar presentation. We do actually still have a few more questions that are in our queue that we're not able to get to, but we'll get your answers to you via email or by phone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact Bridget Finnegan. And as a reminder, the recording of this presentation will be shared with you tomorrow. I'd like to wish everyone a great rest of your day.